They're coming to get you, Barbara. Welcome to slash lot six oh five slash lot slash lot just, just slash, slash lot, lot. <laughs> dropping the dropping the six oh five I still screw up the intro even months <laughs> later. <laughs> uh, I am Sam the Dan Lens. As always, I'm joined by my co-host Casey the Killer Kelderman. How are you doing, Casey? What's up, Sam? I'm doing awesome. How doing are you? Great, doing great. Good. Uh, really excited to be here today. Uh, we we are missing Blakenstein Ginnathan. He is on paternity leave at the moment. Mm-hmm. It's the second best thing to happen to him in the last two weeks. He just recently the got first, a free state theater. <laughs> the first being the 10,000th customer to the yeah. Sioux Falls State Theater. So congratulations <laughs> on that. Oh, and the baby. And, and the baby. <laughs> but no, no, seriously. Yeah. Bl- congratulations, yeah. Blake. Second kid for blake so i yeah. guess i guess he thinks he needs to take a break from podcasting yeah i don't know i mean he has two kids under what like four so <laughs> we love you blake <laughs> we, we miss you blake please come back soon we do we miss you but take your time with your family enjoy it casey sam we're talking about a trilogy today that I, I started off really liking. Mm-hmm. And we'll see how we respond to the third one. Could you say that the devil made us do this podcast? The devil definitely made us do this podcast, Casey. He hates us. He wants us to suffer. <laughs> Therefore, he made us do the Conjuring Trilogy. The Conjuring Trilogy. Yes. Uh, yeah. Is it sad that I'd rather talk about the Annabelle Trilogy than this one? No, I think I would too, honestly. Because that honestly. series at least gets progressively better as this one, in my opinion, and we'll get to it, gets yeah. progressively worse. Yep, I we're on the same page, Casey. We are on the same page. Uh, I Yeah, I, I'm excited to get into that. Uh, we also have a fan slash at the end of the episode. We will be fan slashing the characters from the Flintstones <laughs> into a horror movie. Yeah. Something random, something fun. That was a random shout out by Maria. She listens to us sometimes. Is she our one listener? She she definitely yeah. She listens to us. I she's listened to every episode so far. Crazy. I know she's our, our our one person that watches our movie nights with yeah, us. But she watches the live watch alongs. <laughs> she doesn't comment much, but she watches. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, um, yeah. So we've got we've got a fun show. Uh, Casey and I are excited to talk The Conjuring, even if... I'm excited to talk about The Conjuring 1 and 2. Yeah. And then I saw The Conjuring, The Devil Made Me Do It. Yes, I I saw that as well. It was a movie. (laughs) Barely. Uh, (laughs) But let's hold off on that. Yeah. Before we get into it, we got to get into our fresh meat. Fresh meat. God, I love it when you do that. All right. Do you want me to go first? I've got another laundry list. You've got a huge list. I do. I right. do you want to go every other? Or do yeah. you two to two to one? How many do you got? I got about oh God, I don't know. Um let me pull I got about six. Here. Did we talk about Saint Maud last time? No, we did not. Okay. Uh, so I'm very excited to hear what you think about Saint Maud. Oh no. I have Don't be. Oh really? I got six okay. of them then. I'm taking out movies that I've watched more than like three times, and especially ones that I've talked about on this mm-hmm. podcast already. Hmm, like, I, did, I don't know, a certain mall killer robot movie? I was about to say, full disclosure, yes, I watched Chopping Mall again, and Christine, and Scream 4. <laughs> but we won't talk about those, because I've gushed about all of those on this podcast. Um, so I have... The suspense is killing me. 12? All right, so, so actually two, that two, works out. Let's do two to one then. Okay, we'll all right, kick it, kick it off. Okay, so my first two are actually, uh, it's a creature feature, double feature. Um, That all rhymed. It did. (laughs) That threw me off a little bit. Um, Yeah, so 
a while back, Maria and I picked up a pack of like 20 uh, 50s sci-fi B movies. Mm -hmm. And one of those movies was Tarantula. I had never okay. seen Tarantula. Have you seen this one? I have not. Oh my God. It's fun. Um, essentially, it's like, it's a typical 50s Can I just guess feature. the plot? It's a giant tarantula that terrorizes a small village yeah, or town. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly what okay. it is. And it, it's fun. Um, apparently, Clint Eastwood is one of the fighter pilots at the end. I didn't know that until after I watched the movie, so I'm kind of wanting to rewatch it and see if I can spot Clint Eastwood somewhere in this movie. I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, yeah, it was a fun is a fun creature feature. Um, I watched it almost a whole month ago, so I don't remember a whole bunch about it. But it was it was a great Saturday afternoon matinee type of movie. I uh, if I would have seen it in the theaters in the fifties, I think I would have really loved it. Um, and yeah, it's just fun. I would recommend at least giving it a rental. Um, and then I followed up with I know we've already talked about this extensively on the Slack okay. channel. Godzilla 98. This is a movie that I have wanted to watch since I was like five years old and this movie came out. Um, I remember the hype surrounding this. I went to Hardee's. I got the, the kids meals with the little Godzilla toys because I, like I saw the trailer and that was the movie that I wanted to see. I wanted to see Godzilla. And then my parents decided Godzilla we're not, we're not wasn't gonna, for me. Yeah, we're not going to watch a Ferris Bueller Godzilla movie. Yeah, exactly. And so my hopes and dreams were crushed for a good 23 years until I finally picked it up on VHS and watched it as God intended on grainy VHS. Yes, that exact VHS. <laughs> yeah. Why do I own this? And I got to say, Casey, I actually kind of loved it. It was terrible, mm -hmm. but oh my God, I had so much fun with this movie. Um, I don't know what Matthew Broderick is doing in this movie at all. Like, I I was. I think he forgot how to act after I, I, after like the mid nineties. Yeah, because like I mean, this was after Election, right? And he was really good in that. And then he's in this, and I I just I don't I don't understand it. But uh, yeah, it was fun. the The effects don't hold up at all. Um, but you know what? I I dug it for what it was, which was just a goofy stupid 90s monster movie yeah, yeah. like the, the, the T godzilla T design godzilla. is so weird but i, I don't know i kind of dug it and i liked all the little godzillas at the end i thought it was fun guys remember how popular jurassic park was let's do that but we only own godzilla yeah okay he's a dinosaur ish too <laughs> yeah so i mean you know you guys almost th the story of godzilla and i feel like i'm probably one of the only people that grew up in the 90s that didn't see this movie uh, until now so you know you know about it take from that what you will i enjoyed it um i think the passage of time probably helped yeah it it i'll be honest I, i'm pretty sure i only rated it like two stars on letterboxd but i definitely hit the little heart next to it because i i can't say i didn't like it <laughs> i will definitely watch it again in another year or two <laughs> aka next week yeah yeah for sure <laughs> Yeah, so those are my first two that okay. I kicked off with. Um, I'll save one that you. I know you watched then. Okay. Um, actually, I was I was on vacation here last week in Cleveland. Yeah. And so one night, you know, I was just in the hotel room by myself. I'm like, I'm just gonna watch TV. I need to shut my mind off. So I watched like the last like 30, 40 minutes of Grease. I'm like, uh, yeah, that's like the one of the greatest musicals ever for me. And then right after, they followed it up with Scream. What? I was like, what, what? What's what is this double feature? That's I'm all incredible. in for it, but yes. <laughs> so I watched. I just watched the Drew Barrymore opening, and then I watched maybe five ten minutes after that and fell asleep. But uh, that opening, though, every time I watch it, gets better. Mm -hmm. it, it is, in my opinion, it's probably the greatest opening in any movie ever. Oh yeah, it's so good. It sets up this entire world that Wes Craven is and Kevin Williamson are building in in Scream and that entire series of. Hey, here's Drew Barrymore, one of the biggest movie stars in the world. You know, Hollywood's dream girl, Steven Spielberg's goddaughter. Like, she is like Hollywood A list act actress at the time. Mm -hmm. And here she is in the opening of a horror movie, right on the cover of the movie and the poster of the movie, and dies within the first 15 minutes. Oh, correct me if I'm wrong. Wasn't she supposed to be Sydney? And then she. 
she she, she, yeah, she I actually think she, I asked believe. to be to go in like switch roles and be Casey Becker uh-huh. for the opening, which I don't yeah. think she gets enough credit for this series, Drew no. Barrymore. I don't because everybody talks about you know the big three: Nev, mm-hmm. David Arquette, Courtney Cox. Like, but you have to throw Drew Barrymore yeah. in there too. Without without her performance, because I mean, it's a genuinely terrifying opening sequence, and a lot of it is just because she. I mean. She sells it. Mm-hmm. There's not a moment where you don't believe she is in immediate danger. And I, I love, I love the screen franchise, but it arguably peaked at its very first scene. You know what I mean? Like, well, yeah, the, I, I do agree. The, the opening scene of scream is the best scene in any scream movie. Yeah. Like it is. It's hard to argue that it's not. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that the rest, like, because I even, I even love Scream Three. I'm not gonna lie. I, I, there's not a single Scream movie so far that I, I haven't liked. So, don't fuck it up, right? Radio, radio silence. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I, I love Scream. I love that opening. Mm-hmm. It's so good. And it, it, there's a reason it's been parodied many, many, many times. Oh, yeah. And it, I don't think that changes any of the impact that it has. Like, of course, I I think of Scary Movie every time I watch the opening of Scream. Uh, or really, anytime I watch Scream, like, Scary Movie's there on the back of my mind, too. Because I think Scary Movie is a great parody of, it of Scream, which is a satire of horror movies already. I, yeah. Deputy Doofy is absolutely <laughs> like I can't watch. I told you not to come in the room while I'm vacuuming. <laughs> I, I can't even watch David Arquette in these movies anymore without thinking about Deputy Dewey from the first scary movie. The the scene that always gets me is is um when uh Billy walks in or climbs into uh Neff Campbell's room into Sydney's room in the beginning of the movie. Oh yeah, yeah. I always think of uh James Vanderbeek. <laughs> climbing up oh sorry wrong set and yeah, walking yeah. <laughs> like i'm just waiting for that moment i'm like oh yeah it's not in this movie it's it's, it's in the the parody yeah and it's so funny because like i mean scary movie arguably went downhill almost immediately that that series arguably yeah, arguably i think two might be better than one. Oh really ah uh, i i like one and three two is not my three favorite is really good. but uh after three is where I yeah I, I, four I, I and five are just yeah, bad. bad, but it's really funny because I feel like as iconic as Scream is, Scary Movie in certain ways is just as iconic, and it's just I don't know, it's insane because I remember as many like straight up ghost face masks on Halloween as I remember like the smiling ghost mm-hmm. face mask on Halloween. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was just funny, and I always thought they were from the same movie until I actually watch both of them I'm like mm-hmm. oh oh my god yeah and is it i find it crazy that scary movie can hold up so well being compared to scream like i yeah. genuinely think scary movie is a great comedy oh i do too whereas yeah. scream is also a great comedy and uh and a great great horror, horror movie, movie. Yeah. yeah yeah i i love both of them i god yeah i could gush about scream all day yeah well uh, yeah we'll have we, a scream are, episode at we've some point. sort of done the scream episode and we'll do it again because it's <laughs> just that goddamn good yeah exactly <laughs> um my next two uh this, okay so have you have you watched it's me billy yet no i haven't oh my god okay, i tried so. to put it on and, and then uh i got the big kibosh and that's from the fiance oh gotcha yeah um we're not watching the slash movie tonight oh my god uh i you know this is the one time where i probably side with that it's terrifying and i i side with that because like I loved it. It was like it was the follow up. Do you want to explain to, what, what what it is? Yeah, though? sorry. It's it's a it's a Black Christmas fan film by Dave McRae, um, and he it, it essentially follows the granddaughter of Jess from the original and her friends as they go back to this house. Her, her grandmother has passed, and she's she's back in this town where, um, where you know all this stuff happened years ago, and essentially. Billy comes back and starts terrorizing them. And this, this is so much a movie that is made for fans of the original black Christmas. Um, I really don't like either of the remakes. Um, Weirdly enough, I actually prefer the 2019 one to the 2006 one. I do not like the 2006 one at all. And this one is very much in the vein of that original 
1974 one. It focuses on tension. It focuses on scares. I would argue they made Billy even more terrifying in this fan film than even in the original. I mean, this this movie, I slept with the lights on after I watched it, and it's free on YouTube, but it is it is chilling. It is downright chilling, and it's got so many fun surprises for fans of the franchise and even like even nods to certain things that weren't necessarily in the original, but just like black Christmas fans have come to like accept into the canon and the mythology and all that. Uh, so it, like it takes place in the same universe as a Christmas story. Yeah, sort of <laughs> it's it's there's, there's just, Oh my God. I, I've been, I've been watching like Dave McRae has been putting out different videos on like things you might've missed in the movie mm-hmm. and thing, And I'm just, I'm eating it all up because I really did like this. Um, I highly recommend it. It's like, I want to say it's like 50 minutes. So just a little under an hour. And it, it flies by. It feels like 20 minutes. Honestly, it, it is, it is so tension. It te- like it, it cranks up the tension. It's unnerving. Um, I really enjoyed this. I've not felt this way about a slasher film since I watched the original 1974 black Christmas, like four or five years ago. Um, I was checking my apartment for crawl spaces after this movie and like, yeah, slept with the lights on and everything. It, it got under my skin in a very good way. But don't watch it home alone like I did. <laughs> yeah, I, I will definitely check it out. I, I think we should do a, a fan film episode. That would be cool. That would be fun. Because there are some fun ones. Oh, my God. Especially recently. Mm-hmm. I've been really digging some of them. Like Never so. Hike Alone, Never Hike in mm-hmm. uh, Snow. Yep. Uh, Jimmy Champagne did a, uh, I can't remember what it was called, but he did a Halloween mm-hmm. fan film that was like an interlude in the middle of the 2018 movie. And it was really cool. Really cool how it fit in there. Chucky one that is coming out or just came out too. Yeah, I think it's coming. Yeah, I don't know if it's out yet, but I'm excited for the sci-fi series. So what we're trying to get as me and Sam should make a chopping mall fan film. Yes, we 100 should. Oh my god, if we could get Kelly Maroney in our fan film, chopping mail, chopping mail. (laughs) I still think that's an amazing title for a sequel. The mail it never. We need to do it. We'll I, do it. Yeah, yeah. we'll you, do it. You heard it here first. <laughs> um, and then my my second one of this round, uh, I watched The Empty Man on Blake's mm-hmm. recommendation, and I don't know if I loved it as much as he did. Um, it's a solid like three out of five for me. There are some really cool things in it. Um, he's right. The end. The ending is ballsy. It it swings for the fences. It's very urban legendy. I mean, it, it essentially follows this like this deity where it's looking for a vessel. You know, this empty man is looking for a vessel. And as it turns out, it, 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 God, I don't know how to explain the plot of this movie without going into spoiler territory. Uh, essentially, it is it is an urban legend about the empty man if you say is if you summon him on a bridge he will come you you know you will die there are some really intense things in this movie but overall i don't think it needed to be two and a half hours um and yeah the ending the ending almost wraps up too quickly to be satisfying um i think if they would have explored it a little more it's one of those weird movies. It's the where, biggest like, it's, criticism it's, I've heard of, yeah. of the movie is the ending, and that seems strange for a movie that's freaking two and a half hours. Long. Yeah, it, it's weirdly too long, but also not long enough. You know, <clears throat> like, like too long but rushed. Yeah, yeah, and so it, and it doesn't feel that way. like it's very it's very well paced. Like it's it's leisurely paced for the first two hours, and then the last half hour happens. It's like oh, all this. Like all this just happened in the course of 30 minutes in this movie. And I'm not sure how I feel about that. You know, I would recommend giving it a, giving it a watch because it's very, very atmospheric. Um, James, ba- James Badge Dale is, I, I enjoy watching him in things and he's very good in this. Um, yeah. I don't know if I would give it as hard of a recommendation as Blake, but I, I do 
I did really like quite a bit of it. So yeah, that's one out. Yeah. Did you rent it or is it streaming anywhere? Well, yeah. I bought it because it was on Amazon for like five bucks. And I was like, well, five, it was actually yeah. cheaper to buy it on Amazon than it was to rent, rent it. it. So I was like, well, I'll just buy it then. So yeah. And I, I enjoyed it. Sweet. So I, w- I would say, yeah, check out the empty man. Yeah. I'll, I'll wait till it shows up on streaming. Hell, it might be on Hulu already. I was about to say it'll be on Hulu. If it's not already, it'll be on Hulu in a couple months for sure. Um, next one I will jump into then, um, since you talked about, you know, watching a movie on YouTube, a fan film, I'm going to jump into a a short film from Ari Aster, uh, before Hereditary, um, and before Midsummer. uh, this is the strange thing about the Johnsons. And so this movie has been literally sitting in my YouTube, like, uh, watch later list for like a year. And so finally I'm like going through it and I'm like, I, I just need to watch this thing. It's only like 30 minutes long. Finally, I pop it on. Have you seen this movie, Sam? Do you know what it's about? I, I've not seen it, but I know what it's about. Okay. Um, <laughs> I worry I, I, for that man's yeah. mental health to be yeah. totally honest. With you. I don't, I, I don't want to know what his family life was like. No. I don't, I'm sorry, Ari Aster. I hope you are doing well. I hope you're taking care of yourself. Um, I'm hoping that you just had a normal life and you just have an effed up mind and yeah. that's the type of stories you want to tell out, but I don't, I don't know what his actual family story is. Yeah. I mean, he might've grown up a very, in a very happy, healthy home. And that but is you not want, evidence in, in any of his movies. No. <laughs> uh, God, do I want to say what this movie's about? I mean, it is a few years old. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. It's fine. So I just want to, I want to describe the opening scene or I won't go any. Uh, you know further than that so Mm -hmm. it is uh, it's about this young boy who's you know going through puberty when the movie opens and he uh you see him masturbating in his bed and you just see like the blanket moving up and down the dad walks into the room like typical dads like jim's dad in american pie Mm -hmm. uh it's pretty much that (laughs) same scene uh and basically the dad just tells him like oh this is this is all right it's normal everybody does this it's just something you go through you're at that certain age that typical thing and while the kid was doing this he was holding a picture at the time you don't see what the picture is but as soon as the dad leaves he steps back and he's like oh i love you son well i love you too dad and the dad walks out the camera pans down to the picture and it's a picture of the dad and that's the the cold open of his movie and yeah it's a shocking cold open uh, you don't know how to respond to that after. Like is it, yeah. Yeah. Is it played first, for like, laughs? Is it played for, ooh, is it like, yeah. yeah. Ugh. So, and then the rest of the movie do- continues that sort of trend, you know, 10 years later with the, the father and the son and uh, what that all means. But I mean, I, it, it's an incredible movie in, in terms of storytelling, uh, especially for, I, I think this was a student film or right after he was, you know, finished with, with, with schooling, but it's incredibly in shocked interview that I heard he, he had done this. He, that, this was like his final project yeah. in college or whatnot. Yeah. <laughs> his professors like, passed him. I, I mean, mean, from what I've heard, it's a very well done. Movie. Oh, it is very well done. Very well acted. Uh, he has some great shots in this movie too. Great use of lighting. You can tell like, this is the guy that would go on to make hereditary in midsummer with the way everything is shot, the lighting, the acting, the insane storytelling. <laughs> that no one else can tell these types of stories. And he does. Um, and I, I just gotta say, I'm glad he's making movies. Yeah. I, you know, I, I'm stoked to watch midsummer next, uh, this, this, this next weekend at the, at the state for, I know I'm super jealous. Yeah. You should come. I'm going to be at my cousin's wedding. <laughs> Skip the wedding. I wanted to, um, you yeah, like the midsummer festival is more important. I don't know. Oh, you weren't, you weren't at the, the double feature when they played the trailer. I got really excited like to the point where I was like almost screaming because I was like, Oh my God, this is like one of my favorite movies. I love it. And then the date popped up at the end and I like really <laughs> loudly went, no fuck. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, and I was like, Oh God, I need to control myself. But uh, yeah, no, I, I think that's going to be incredible. Mm-hmm. And I'm very happy for you. I will hopefully see Hedwig and the angry inch the night before I leave for the wedding. But uh, yeah, I am very bummed that I am I not going to. I, make I, it to have you seen Hedwig? I have not. Oh, it's so good. Um, And that's what I like. 
I've just, it's been one that's been on my watch list for a while and I just, I've never, never gotten around to it. And then I saw that the state was playing. I'm like, what better place to experience mm-hmm. it for the first time. So I'm excited for that. So what do you got next? Um, okay. So I, I watched the, um, is it Joe Cornish? Maybe Joe, Wright? I don't know. Uh, one of the British Joes who did, uh, the kid who would be King, his first feature mm-hmm. attack the block. I had never seen. I didn't really care for the kid who would be king, but I had heard really good things about Attack the Block, and I was like, ah, I'm going to watch it. And it was fine. I, I liked it. I thought the creature design was really fun. John Boyega is clearly a star in this. Um, essentially, it's about a, a group of kids in a, a group in the of kid, UK. Yeah, yeah, in the UK that kind of are in a uh, seedier neighborhood and things like that. And, you know, that one of them, Moses, played by John Boyega, is. Um, you know, working for like a, a drug dealer in the town and stuff and aliens come down one night and they essentially have to defend their neighborhood from uh, these aliens that are eating people. And uh, yeah, the alien design is really fun. There are some cool set pieces. Um, I just, I never feel like it quite reaches the heights that like it was kind of the same way as I felt about the kid who would be king, where I was like, "This was good." It just didn't ever take it to that next. Yeah, level. you know what I mean. It was just kind of just enjoyable mm-hmm. throughout, you know. And it, that's fine. And I know a lot of people love this movie. So see, that's that's what I th- I thought I was missing something when I watched Attack the Block for the first time. I yeah, was like, I, I liked it. Like, there's nothing bad about it. But I'm yeah. like, I don't know what the all the fanfare is about. Like, where people are. Yeah, wanting a sequel so bad. Yeah, I, I don't mean, know. I'll watch the sequel. Yeah, like because I'm pretty sure they already greenlit it and everything. But I, yeah, it was just one of those where I, kind of like you, I'm like, I don't know if I just missed something or what. But it, it was very good. I I can't really say anything negative about it, but it also just didn't didn't wow me or anything. You know, that's how I felt about it too. And speaking of that exact same. uh thing uh demons i watched demons for the first time um i know blake loves this movie i'm Mm -hmm. pretty sure it showed up on our 80s horror countdown Mm -hmm. and it showed up in his (laughs) all-nighter um and i i liked it there was some good gore i felt like the acting was terrible even for an 80s horror movie um i felt like all the actors were playing it super serious when i felt like the premise was very campy and if you've listened to our podcast before, I'm terrible at detailing the plots. Um, yeah, it's about a group of people who go to this like one night only screening of a movie that essentially starts turning people into demons. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's about these people trying to escape a theater that is now becoming overrun with like these these demon people. Um, and it was fun. There was some good gore. I love the lighting in this. Um, the score was really fun. Uh I just felt like it was kind of tonally at odds with itself. Um, it was, it, it never like went full on campy to the point where I was like, ah, oh, this is great. And it like, but it was, is a little too goofy to be taken completely serious too. But I will say the, so the it's guy, an, it's an Italian horror movie. Yeah. 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 I, maybe Italian horror just isn't my thing. Cause there've been a few that I've watched that I'm just kind of, I don't know. Hmm. Well, we'll see. I'll watch more because I've only seen like two or three, but uh, yeah, I I liked it enough. Um, the the motorcycle and the samurai sword sequence was dope. I love that. The uh, the Billy Idol scene is is like one of my favorites. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it's great. I, I, yeah, I there were parts of it I really liked. It just overall didn't quite do it for me. Mm -hmm. But I was glad I finally watched it. Um, I would one hundred percent watch it in Blake's All Nighter still, Mm -hmm. uh, because is fun enough to warrant watching it again in the future. So yeah, definitely check out demons too as well. Okay. I will for sure. Yeah. Especially like, like, like uh, the, the new evil dead reminds me so much of demons too. Oh, like really? The plot, it sounds very similar, huh. which I'm very excited about. Nice. Yeah. So it's basically like takes place in a high rise apartment and demons get unleashed in the apartment. Okay. So they go to like the parking ramp below and they're up through the stairway wells and different apartments and, Nice. That's pretty awesome. That sounds awesome. Yeah. Uh, next up for me, I'm gonna I'm gonna go to uh, one that well, we talked about on Backlot. I'll, I'll 
keep it very brief. Uh, Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2, Freddy's yes. Revenge. We did in t- uh, a couple weeks ago now for Pride Month. Um, Great episode, yeah. by the way. Thank you. Uh, and my immediate response after having uh, our guest Josh Corngut from the Development Hell podcast on the Dread Central uh, Network was, I need to get Josh and Sam on a podcast together. <laughs> Because that amount of energy and passion for horror needs to be expressed in podcast form. Yeah, uh, I loved listening to it. I 100% want to uh, want to connect with uh, Josh and we we, talk some we should try to get him sure. on. We should try to get him on here and maybe talk about some development hell movies or movies that should have been in development hell that finally got made. But yeah, I would be I would be on board for that for mm-hmm. sure. And maybe uh, get redemption for Christine. I don't know. Yeah, uh, since I wasn't there to defend my sweet red lady. Can't believe you guys. Again. Boring. That... You can call Christine a lot of things, but boring. I don't love Christine. I, I actually feel like the same way I, I do about Attack the Block as I do Christine. Like That's fair. It's not bad. But it's just not exci- exciting me. I don't know. I I know part of it is just sweet nostalgia for it i it was one of the first horror movies that i watched and oh my god i just Mm -hmm. love that movie so much uh but yeah nightmare on elm street 2 this movie's awesome i love this movie uh it kind of grows on me every time i watch it in a way because the first time i watched it when i was doing my binge uh for for the whole series um was that okay i kind of like this one has some fun stuff it's really campy um some weird weird sexual stuff going on in this one uh this is me in high school questioning all these things and then i continue the rest of the series and that one was kind of the outlier in it because it doesn't connect to any of the other ones uh but now watching it, it's like this is just a fun 80s slasher movie uh not even really a slasher like an 80s possession yeah type of movie it's it's more like possession and body horror which i thought was really interesting um I mean, it's no surprise that I love this movie. I'm pretty sure on my first episode with you guys, I dropped the hot take that it was my favorite sequel. And it still is. Um, I really love Dream Warriors. I think this one just kind of... I don't know what it is about this movie, but I I put this on the most out of any of the Elm Street movies. Yeah, and I... I know it's not as good as like the first one, or Dream Warriors, or even New Nightmare. Like those are quality wise are just better movies. I'm aware of that. Just there's something about Freddy's revenge that I just love unabashedly. Uh, And I think it's, I don't know. I I just, I really like it. I think Freddy's never been scarier than in this. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, I dig this. I I actually do agree with it. Like, I I think Freddy himself is the scariest he's ever been in the series. Yeah. Whereas I I think the first movie is a scarier movie. Yeah. But I think Freddy himself has never been scary. Yeah, I would agree with that. I would agree with that 100. percent So even Nightmare New Nightmare, because New Nightmare he's pretty scary too. But I still think he's scarier in in Freddy's Revenge. Mm-hmm. He's very angry, Freddy. He is. He just wants to be inside that boy. <laughs> the boy's <laughs> the boy's soul. Yeah, yeah, I dig it, but I digress. What What do you got next? My next one, I'm, I had a lot of fun with this one. I actually ended up watching this one twice. Um, Sorority Babes at the Slime Ball <laughs> Bolarama. Uh, my God. So Shudder has just been killing it with their, their curation and their selections. And Sorority Babes at the Slime Ball Bolarama is another win for horror fans. Because this movie is about... It's about these uh, three nerdy, nerdy college guys who decide to sneak into a sorority house one night and and watch the hazing rituals and be you know eighties perverts. It's Porky's for the first like twenty minutes of this movie, um, and then they get caught and they get roped into the next hazing ritual, which is these girls have to break into a bowling alley and steal a bowling trophy. Well, the bowling trophy that they decide to steal ends up breaking and releasing an imp that then unleashes chaos and possesses a few of them. Um, Weirdly enough, this is kind of what I hoped the tone of demons would be. (laughs) Because this is not a good movie. Um, It's pretty bad, but 
it's fun all the way through. Um, this is another one that I rated like two stars and then hit the little heart next to it on Letterbox. It's like, I, I, it's a bad movie, but I love it. Too. Yeah, it, it was just so much fun. Uh, I, I dug it. Um, the imp is so cheesy and laughable. It's literally, it's like a puppet. It, it, it's so funny. Um, Lena Quigley is in this as a badass like biker chick mm-hmm. who's trying to like she's also breaking into the bowling alley to steal um like you know cash and stuff like that but yeah me more interested now yeah and she's incredible in this mm-hmm. movie uh as she is in everything but yeah she's she's great she's like the badass and uh it, I don't know it this movie just does some truly just zany shit and i love it for that um i would highly recommend it if you have shutter uh not a good movie but a fun one to put on especially if you're maybe a little drunk or you know you hit that midnight uh, hour you're like i I, yeah. I, can, I can fit one more horror movie in. yeah exactly it, it's best seen it in the late night when you're a little delirious and just ready to laugh something uh, laugh with something uh yeah and then I'm just gonna put these two together. Uh, I I did. I went to the Alien Aliens double feature at the mm-hmm. Sioux Falls State Theater. I had already seen Alien, um, and I, I like that movie enough. It, it's it's a little slow for my taste. I, I I don't necessarily get a feel for any of the characters either. But the practical effects are incredible. The final act with Sigourney Weaver is incredible. Um, I I like I like Alien a lot. Um, but I think I respect it more than I enjoy watching it aliens on the other hand my god that movie blew me away um so this was the first time watching yeah aliens for you yeah okay yeah this was a first time watching aliens and i'm a horror person but i'm also very much into that like hyper violent 80s action Mm -hmm. and that is what aliens delivered in spades and uh sigourney weaver is just incredible in this movie i i she expands on the character of ripley so well in this um you know i mean this has an all-star cast in it um and actual characters for the all-star cast to actually inhabit as opposed to the first one and i know people are gonna hate me for that opinion but come at me um he's at uh lens on film yep at lens on film you Go for it, guys. I I stand by what I said. Uh, yeah. So I loved I loved Aliens. Like I said, I like Alien. Loved Aliens. Uh, it was really cool mm-hmm. to see it at the state. Um, yeah. It was just it was fun. Yeah. It was a good night. I was Disappoint- I was glad I went. Disappointed I couldn't make it because I yeah. I don't love either movie. Like I like both mm-hmm. of them a lot, but I don't love them. And I'm like I need to love these movies. Like there's something missing about them for me. And I think partially it's that. I need to see these in a big, on a big screen in, yeah. a, in a theatrical setting. So was, yeah, I was upset I couldn't make it, but uh, I would not be surprised if they two years from now would do this double feature again. Yeah, I would be I would be surprised if they didn't play these at the state again at some mm-hmm. point for sure. I'm kind of hoping they do the same thing with Midsommar, to be totally honest. But yeah, again, that movie I didn't see in theater, so I'm excited to oh, watch really? that. Oh, really? Oh God. Yeah. That was like an opening night one yeah. for me. I was like, yeah, I got to see this. Yeah, that was uh, so honestly like some summer movies is like, you know, every weekend is a new movie, you know, type of thing, mm-hmm. uh, which is so goddamn hard to get to every movie then. Yeah, which is sure. where like, especially in the summer when for us in South Dakota, I don't want to sit in a movie theater every single weekend. I want to actually do stuff because we only have three months of like of nice of no snow. Um, yeah. So I don't want to sit in a movie theater. So if that's I what... lived out in Cali, I would be a little more liberal yeah. with my. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah. that's that's definitely why, why I missed that one. It was just that's why I missed a quiet place too. Now of just other stuff going on. Yeah, in South yep. Dakota. But uh, well, you still have time to see a quiet place too, and I would highly recommend it. Otherwise, wait. If you don't see it in theaters, you're at least going to watch it in my theater room because that movie deserves the biggest screen you can possibly get. I'm hoping to check it out in the theater. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying. Uh, next up, I, I'll go with the Shutter movie since you brought up one. Uh, I watched George A. Romero's Lost film, The Amusement Park, which is it's sort of a lost film, but it's more of kind of this project that Romero was working on. Um, so he was basically hired by um, 
a company in Pittsburgh. Uh, Wasn't it like a Christian company? Yeah, or a church it was a, 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 a church that was trying to make PSAs for um, basically trying to convince people to, you know, go and vis- visit elderly people in, in nursing homes or community homes or anything like that. And basically trying to get more people involved in the, in that type of community. And so the church, someone there who was working on that project was like, well, I know a filmmaker and it was George A. Romero probably didn't tell them. This is the guy who made night of the living dead or anything yeah, like that. I, but I doubt it. <laughs> He, he said he knew a filmmaker, and sure enough, George Romero signed on and did this little PSA. It's about an hour long. And oh, it's only an hour? Yeah, it's only an hour long, okay. like 50-some minutes long. Okay. Um, I'm sure it was to be aired on TV or sent out to different places. I'm not sure what the distribution was, was set to, to be for. But even though it is an hour long and it is a PSA, this is still a george romero movie like he has total creative control over this movie so basically the plot is uh, this elderly man he's sitting in this white room about the size of the room that we're in right now all by himself all in white everything in this room is white and he's just beaten and battered and destroyed and another elderly man walks in that kind of is like a mere reflection of of himself you know looks perfectly fine no bruises, no marks on him. Very chipper and happy. And basically says to, to the, to the old man, like, like what happened to you? And the old other guy's like, well, I went outside and outside is bad. Don't go out there. It's a terrible place. And the other guy's, ah, you're, you're full of it. I'm going outside. I'm going to have fun. It's fun out there. And the elderly, elderly gentleman opens the door and goes outside and ends up in an amusement park. And basically the amusement park is just our entire life. Um, including a hilarious uh, bumper car sequence, which is about uh, an old man getting into a car accident with a younger gentleman. Uh, Uh, And like the police show up to the bumper cars and try to write the old man a ticket. uh, And there's witnesses. It's this movie is just incredible. It's about, uh, you know, Romero's reflection of elderly people and how they view life and how, again, taking social commentary uh, like only Romero can with, you know, his living dead movies, um, the crazies. And now this movie too can be added into that same type of story of just reflections on real life and real people. And that's what I found really fascinating about this movie, that it is a PSA, but it is also just a goddamn terrifying movie of, to think of how people treat elderly people. It makes you look at how you treat elderly people very differently as well. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's just another knockout from Romero, just, uh, especially for it not being technically a movie. It's a knockout. That's awesome. I I've, I've heard really good things about it. I've also heard that it is very heavy mm-hmm. and, uh, I just, you know, there's a reason I watched sorority babes at the slime ball bowl twice. And it's just, Right now, I don't you would need have to heavy. Watch, you would have to watch the amusement <laughs> park first. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I am going to get to that one eventually because um, I am really excited to see it. Uh, when I heard that was coming to Shutter, I was mm-hmm. I was very stoked. I just, man, I got to be in the right headspace for that one. Yeah, and luckily it's only like I said, fifty some minutes long, so that's good. You can yeah. easily pop on Chopping Mall right after Sam. Good. I love and only have mall. two hours of your life. <laughs> um okay so my next two uh speaking of a quiet place part two that's my next Mm -hmm. one um if you've seen the first quiet place you know the drill i mean there's monsters they hunt by sound um and this just follows the the journey of the abbott family after the events of the first one um it does start with like a cold open of like day one, the one, the one that's in the trailer. Yeah. 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 And there's so much more to it than what was in the trailer. And it's, it's a knockout piece. It, it, I, I, Krasinski is a master of genre. Um, even Even after just two movies, no, he doesn't think he is, but my God, the dude could make horror movies for the rest of his life. And I would be there first in line every single time. Uh, the tension in this movie is incredible. Um, throughout the second half of the movie, there's literally it, it jumps 
between three different storylines without losing tension in every single one of them. It's like the editing work on this is incredible. I mean, it never loses the sense of tension. My shoulders were sore when the credits started rolling and I finally took a breath. Uh, I, I actually think I liked part two more than I liked the first one. And the first one was like a top three of its year for me. As of right now, a quiet place part two is my favorite movie this year. Um, it did knock out psycho gore, man. Uh, Barely. I mean, Psycho Gorman is incredible, but I digress. Uh, yeah, I highly recommend A Quiet Place Part 2, and I really recommend seeing it on the biggest screen possible. I went to an XD screening, and it was just, it blew my mind, man. It blew my mind. Uh, yeah, Krasinski, I know he's not signing on for the third one, which makes me a little worried for the third one, but uh, I can't say that I'm not going to, I'm not, I can't say that I'm not going to go opening weekend to a third one of mm-hmm. these because these first two are just incredible. Uh, I love just, them. Just, rem- just remember the movie series we're talking about today where someone else took over for a third. I know. And series. that's, you know, it's so funny. That's exactly <laughs> what I thought of when I saw that Krasinski was not returning for a third one. I'm like, oh, God. Oh, no. Um, I also, I, I rented the new Simon Barrett movie, Seance. Mm-hmm. Um, this follows a girl who like, essentially it's a throwback slasher. It opens with a group of girls at this prestigious boarding school playing a prank that goes wrong. A girl, you don't really know if she jumps out the window or if she's pushed out the window, like it's very murky and gray area, um, as to what happened to her. But essentially this girl falls out of her dormitory window and dies and a new girl comes in to take the place of this girl, uh, of the, the girl who died, uh, played by the main final girl is played by Suki Waterhouse, who I've heard like great things about. I've never seen her in anything because apparently she's in a movie called The Bad Batch. I want to say she's in like Assassination Nation or something mm. like that. And apparently she's been putting out great genre performances in a bunch of movies. And this is no different. Uh, I loved her in this. She essentially, she comes to the school and all of a sudden more girls start dying. Um, They're getting killed off and it's being made to look like accidents. And meanwhile, the ghost of the original dead girl might be haunting the hallways of this. Like, it's very interesting because it it takes a throwback slasher premise and sprinkles in a little ghost story to it. So it's very atmospheric. Um, it's a little bit of a slow burn and a lot of the deaths are off screen in the first two acts, which I know rubbed a lot of people the wrong way, but my God, that third act has two pieces of top notch practical gore. One and one of those kills. I so want to win a Fangoria chainsaw award because it's one of the best kills I've seen in any horror movie ever. I love it. And I'm probably overhyping it a little bit, but oh my God, I really dug the third act. It brings everything together in a really fun, unique way with some twists that only like that only Simon Barrett could really like deliver Mm -hmm. on, you know, Um, this is a little more slow and melancholy than his previous uh, efforts with like Adam Wingard. It definitely has like a moodiness to it. That's helped by, a great score. Uh, the score I've been listening to almost nonstop since I watched this movie. Um, I love it. And yeah, I highly recommend it. I know it's one of the RJLE films, Mm -hmm. so it'll be on shutter in a few months or whatnot. But I mean, God, I, I'm not going to lie. I might end up buying this one, uh, before it even hits Mm -hmm. shutter because I really dug it. Um, not perfect, but I just had a lot of fun with it. Yeah, that'll be one of those movies like uh, Jacob's Wife. That I'm just, I'll I'll wait. For, I can wait for Shutter. Yeah, I like watching these movies on Shutter. Like, uh, well, yeah, it's kind of fun to. I've done that on a few. Like Daniel isn't real. I waited until it hit Shutter. Um, even though I was super stoked for that, mm-hmm. but there's a, there's a sense of like community mm-hmm. when you wait for it to hit Shutter and like you experience it with a bunch of yeah. other people. So especially when they started doing the live tweet alongs. I wish they would do more of those. Yeah, they should definitely do more of those. They, they should keep going. Cause I mean, 
just because we're not in a pandemic anymore doesn't mean that people aren't sitting at home tweeting about movies, Mm -hmm. especially like an opening weekend on, on shutter. Oh yeah, Yeah. for sure. I I think, I think shutter should definitely keep doing that. Cause I mean, to be fair that the pandemic did not change most of my habits at all. I, I, went about I went out about the same amount of times which is to say I didn't go out much. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh next up for me I, I think you said is on your list too that you watched uh Saint Maud or is... I have not watched it. Oh no. you have not watched I, it. I, I'm just oh, okay. very curious to hear your thoughts on it because oh, no. I I uh I like religious horror. Yeah. But I've I've heard very mixed things uh-huh. about this movie. Uh, yeah, St. Maud, uh, A24 horror movie was supposed to be released last year, early last year. It was one of yeah. the first movies kind of got pushed back. Big hype train for it last year that mm-hmm. I feel really petered out because of its delay in the pandemic. Because of its delay and where it ended up. It ended up on... Wasn't that like Epics or something? Epics, yeah. yeah. Who has Epics? Yeah, I was like, I don't... And I'm then, not going to get another streaming service for yeah, this. For that, yeah. And uh, there was a free trial, too. I'm like, I'm yeah. not going to go through my time to yeah. sign up for a free trial and forget to Exactly. And <laughs> all of a sudden it. have a $15 charge coming to, to, to Epix. <laughs> like, what is Epix? I don't even remember what this is. <laughs> um, but like, it ended up on Hulu, which is where I think it is right now, too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, St. Maud, uh, 824 horror movie. And it's... Honestly, this movie... Uh, I I just could not get into it is very much lacking in a lot of scares. Um, It is technically a slow burn movie, except when the burn happens, it's just like lighting a match and it's blown out right away Uh, because the, well, almost literally with the final stuff of this movie. I've had this movie spoiled for me. So you're talking pretty literally, aren't you? (laughs) Yeah. Literally with a a light of a match. Um, Yeah. Uh, anything interesting is within two seconds of the final two seconds of this movie, That's um, crazy. which is, sucks. Uh, yeah, I was very excited to watch this. It has some incredible shots, very great performance, a great lead performance in this movie. But like the scares are just, I don't know. It kind of reminded me of, uh, um, oh, what's William Brent Bell type of scares of like, mm. there's no payoff to them. There's not a real great setup to, to a lot of them. Um, yeah, I don't. It just was not clicking for me at all, and it's. I'll, I'll steal a Jeremy Johns lines line uh, that he uses at the end of his reviews. You're not going to remember this movie in about t minus two days, and I watched this two weeks ago, and that's yeah for sure. Uh, like it's just a very forgettable movie. Nothing that stands bums me out. out. Um, it's not like an outright bad movie. It's just nothing is clicking in this movie. It feels like a whole lot of. It's Nothing so is happening in it. I feel like you can say a lot about most A24 movies, and whether you like their particular brand of horror or not, forgettable to me is just not. But like that's, the, wi- the that's witch, common... the witch, I don't, I didn't care for the first time I watched it, but it's an unforgettable movie. Yeah, you, it you is. You don't forget about that movie. This no. one, it's just unfortunately you you do. That's that's such a bummer, man. I I still I'm gonna watch it at some point. I just yeah. I man, I I love religious horror. I love a twenty four, so this seemed right up my alley. But mm-hmm. man, the, I'm not gonna lie. The delay, I kind of forgot about this movie, and then they did the epics release, and I was like, well, I'm not gonna watch it now. I didn't even know it was on Hulu. To be yeah. totally honest, and with honestly, you. like I've I've talked many times on Backlot about not doing the twenty dollar rentals, but if they would have done that with this movie, with how much marketing and hype they had behind it. When it oh, was they made originally going to come out, I would have done the twenty dollars rental on this movie back then. Yeah, well, especially when the pandemic first hit, because like it was a novelty. Like mm-hmm. I did a couple of twenty dollars rentals before I realized, like, wait, I don't need to be doing this. Um, you know, they could have really actually capitalized on that. Yeah. I think uh, yeah. instead of getting people to sign up for Epics a year after its release, Gosh. initial release date. But yeah, that just seems yeah. weird. I have a much better movie that uh, hit streaming to talk about later. Oh, good. Because I'm ending on one really bad movie and one really <laughs> fun movie that I enjoyed. Um, so I finally watched... I've, I've watched the movie Urban Legend probably close to like 20 or 30 times throughout my life. I love that movie. I have never seen a sequel to it. Mm-hmm. And so I watched Urban Legend's Final Cut and I did not like it. Okay, yeah. 
there's some That's interesting the third, stuff. Third, third one, right? No, is I think it? Bloody Mary is the third one. Yeah. I think this is the second one. And it was on Tubi. And I was just like, God, I really love that. Like, it was written by Scott Derrickson. It's set in a film school. I'm like, that's ripe for, like, the urban legend type of thing. Like, or any slasher in general. Especially, like, in 90s post school. Scream. Yeah. Slasher. yeah. And I felt like it never did all that much with that premise. You know? Like, there was never a moment where I was like, oh, yeah, they just think it's a movie. And it's, you know what I mean? Like, there were a few fleeting glimpses of that. Where like they're in a screening room and all of a sudden footage from an actual kill gets put on and like they're all like, oh wow, who did that? But I'm like, but there's no tension there because the footage was put in like a whole day after the girl was killed. So it's not like there's any tension there, mm-hmm. you know? And there's another one with like sound design where they're hearing someone over the mics getting picked up, getting bludgeoned to death. And that was like the best part of the whole thing, because like you're hearing this. While your recordings, like the the final girl is hearing screams that aren't the screams that she's recording in her ADR session. And that's the most tense set piece in the whole movie. That was the only one that does anything like that. You know, and it, it, it just, I don't know, it fell flat for me. Mm-hmm. As much as I love the first one, this one just, there were moments of, of genius in it, but otherwise it, it really just didn't work. Although the very final scene, have you seen this? Okay, I have not very... seen either sequel. No. Oh my God. So the very final scene, I'm not going to spoil it, but it, it's really fun. <laughs> it's really fun. Uh, I, I did like the very last shot of the movie. I was like, Oh God, that's, that's incredible. I'm so glad they did that. Um, But yeah, I, I'd say, you know, watch it on Tubi for free, but, it, it's not something you need to rush out and see. Maybe you'll like it more than I did. I just, I don't know. I know the first one isn't like some like esteemed genre classic, but I do hold it pretty close to me. So, and that's that's like one of my favorite eras of horror movies. So yeah, I will probably at least like it on some level. Yeah, and I did too. I think I gave it like two and a half. Like it's okay. Mm-hmm. It's one that like if I was doing an urban legend marathon, I would I would watch it. You know, but I'm not gonna. I'm going to go for the first one every time, Mm -hmm. you know? And then I finally, so after having started and stopped this movie a couple different times, I finally watched the entirety of fade to black Mm -hmm. on shutter. Oh my God. This is the movie. I wish Joker was this. (laughs) This was such a good movie. This was, Oh, I mean, essentially, I mean, we know that you've talked about this one on the podcast before it's the, you know, a, a cinephile who is kind of just beaten down in life, who ends up going crazy, taking on movie characters and killing people. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know if I would even consider this like a straight up horror movie as much as I would just almost consider it like a tragedy, you know, because you're watching this guy just kind of descend into madness. And um, yeah, it's not yeah. really uh, you wouldn't really put it as a slasher. It does have slasher elements. Yeah, but it also has like the kind of like you said the tragedy to it. Also, it's a very Hollywood. Yeah, yeah, very LA movie. It's, it's almost like a celebration of movies. It ends at the uh, Chinese, <laughs> the theater, Chinese theater. It's yeah, awesome. Oh, it's so cool. I like the the love and inch- the love interest is a Marilyn Monroe lookalike. Yes, I think my, that was my biggest issue with the movie was the second act. It felt like it forgot about her. Mm-hmm. You know, she's like very prominent in the first and third act, and then the second act, she just kind of disappears for a while. And I'm sorry that she was great. Like she's incredible. Not only is she legit like a dead ringer for Marilyn Monroe but she was maybe my favorite character in the whole thing uh and I I just I wanted more of her I wanted more of their Mm -hmm. back and forth uh state theater you need to play this uh, yeah for a late night movie oh my god this would be an incredible late night movie at the state theater uh yeah I really dug fade to black uh if you have shutter I'm pretty sure this is the only way you can get it unless you like go on eBay and buy an overpriced like DVD or Blu-ray of it. So uh, yeah, I I'm pretty sure all the Blu-ray stuff is uh, out of print right now. Um, It's not streaming anywhere except for shutter. It's not available to rent or buy or anything. So 
Shutter's get your Shutter's, Shutter subscription. Yeah, I was about to say Shutter's been killing it lately. I'm pretty sure Sorority Babes at the Slime Bowl Bolorama is the same thing where it's only streaming on Shutter right now. Shutter is finding these movies that have no distribution deals right now, that have no way that people have no way of viewing. Must and they're, they're old crusty old VHS or yeah, DVD. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And and they're they're bringing them into the forefront. And I I just think that's awesome. And Fade to Black is another one of those movies that just it's it's a genuinely just great great movie. Mm-hmm. And yeah, if you have Shutter, definitely check it out. Yeah, I'll I'll echo that. I love that movie. Um, my last one is uh just came out here in the last week or so. Um, untitled horror movie. I can't uh, wait to see this. Yeah, I, I, I've been gushing about it to Sam, saying, "Sam, this is going to be your new like repeat watch movie, like one your, your new dishwashing movie, if you will." Uh, basically, so this movie is written directed by Nick Simon. Uh, us here in South Dakota definitely know of of him because he is from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, um, and you know some of the movies he made. He made The Girl in the Photographs. Um, which I haven't seen that one, but I've heard that one's really good. Mm-hmm. Uh, with with uh, with uh, Cal Penn, um, and then he also made the Sci-Fi Channel Truth or Dare, which is much better than the Blumhouse Truth or Dare. Agreed. <laughs> uh, and uh, um, yeah, so he basically this is this is a movie again that was was shot entirely during the pandemic. Uh, takes place via Zoom and uh, FaceTime calls all shot on iphones by all the actors um so not not too different from host which came out earlier in uh i was well, about earlier to say, in, in late 2020 i know uh i know jed shepherd was a little offended because like variety picked up a piece on on nick simon's movie after host had already been released and was they were calling it like the first uh pandemic horror movie pandemic shot horror movie and he was like all over on twitter going um excuse me <laughs> I th- well i th- there is some i think there is a little validity to it because i think it's the first one that was approved by sag oh okay to shoot like host wasn't no say okay that makes yeah, sense which that makes I, sense. I think is how it goes but i, I don't i don't want to compare the two because they are two totally different movies like i've host, seen the trailer for this one it doesn't yeah, look like no. it, it doesn't just look like another host for no. sure and no, it, it's nothing about like friends getting together to do a seance on a Zoom call and things go bad all in a single night. Nothing like that at all. It takes place over days, weeks with this. Basically, it's about this TV cast that finds out that their TV show is going to get canceled. So they're trying to figure out their next project because uh, they've all wasted their money because they thought they were big TV stars now. And so they're trying to figure out, well, how can we continue to act and make more money? Um, well, kind of keeping it secret that we're shooting something. So they all decide to make this horror movie with each other. And basically they just shoot it on their iPhones while they're in their houses. And then one, one of them will edit it all together and have it make a little sense. Um, which is kind of such a Hollywood thing to do of like, Oh, we can just do it ourselves. Like, why don't we just shoot it in our houses? And one of us will edit it. And the guy who's writing it is just writing scenes as it, as they go on there is no beginning beginning middle or end to it um yeah so it's a meta take on on horror movies in 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 a way because there's a ton of jokes that uh you have to know like the people in the movie who the actors are behind the scenes like who's directing who's who they've worked with and stuff because like claire holt is one of the is probably the biggest name out of this movie and she starred in 47 meters down and there's I, a, I heard she like brags about it. Yeah, story. she's like, I, I was the star of the highest grossing horror movie of 2017 and doesn't say 47 meters down, but like, you know, it's 47 meters down. Right. Um, and they talk about like Dean Cundy in this movie and all the kids are like, well, I don't know who Dean Cundy is. Typical millennials, but Dean yeah. Cundy worked on many movies with Nick Simon. Dean Cundy is absolutely he's like a, one of my he's favorite a God. cinematographers. He's a God. Um, <laughs> he's a God of cinema. Um, and yeah, so this this movie has a total meta t- meta take on on Hollywood and actors and actresses, and yeah, I I, I again you can't compare it to Host because this movie is a comedy first mm-hmm. and foremost, and then a horror movie, even though it is called Untitled Horror Movie, which again I find a hilarious title, and yeah, there's great. a joke in the movie of them calling their movie Untitled Horror Movie because it's the first thing that'll pop up on Google, and sure enough. 
when you type in untitled horror movie on Google, this is the first thing that pops up is this movie. So it's a genius premise. Uh, genius so you're way saying to market it's much movie. more SEO friendly than it. Yes. <laughs> So yeah, if you get yeah, go check this out. It's available to rent and purchase. Uh, yeah. yeah, I had a blast with it. And I'm not like, gonna lie, I'm probably just gonna buy it. Yeah, I rented Seance and I'm kicking myself for it. So yep, I'm just gonna buy Untitled Horror Movie. Yeah, this is gonna be Sam's new warm blanket movie. <laughs> I really hope so. I hope I, so too. I thought the trailer looked like a ton of fun, so I'm very ready for yeah. it. And has some fun cameos in it too. Does it? Yeah, that's awesome. So I won't ruin them unless you you look at the imdb you'll see them they might even be in the trailer i didn't watch the trailer about to say i think i've had a few things spoiled for me just from reading letterbox reviews because i'm an idiot like that (laughs) i see the little darth vader mask and it's like do you want spoilers and i'm like yes yeah (laughs) do it so yeah that's awesome Mm -hmm. so go check it out and we did an interview with nick simon director of the movie so go check that out as well yeah, I can't wait to see that or hear that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. That's Sweet. it. That's what I got That's for it. fresh meat. All right. Let's wrap this show up. So now we've Oh, got... no, we got to talk about the Oh, country. yeah. Oh, yeah. <sighs> Should we jump into it, Sam? Yeah. Can we? Should we start backwards? Yeah, let's start. I was literally <laughs> just going to say, let's start backwards because I, I, I pride myself on being very movie positive. And so I always like to end on a positive note. And to be totally fair, I think the only way to do that is if we go backwards. Yep. Um, because The Conjuring, The Devil Made Me Do It just came out this month. Yep. And I think it's by far the worst of the three. Mm-hmm. And I actually think it's... Might be the worst of this series. Yeah, it really might. I think La Ur- The Curse of La Llorona... Is still, I'd like, I, I would put this one on before the Curse yeah. of La Llorona, just because of Patrick Wilson, Vera Farmiga. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, should we break it down? Like, I, I you, if you're listening to this, you know what the premise for the Conjuring: The Devil Made Me Do It is. It's the Warrens. They're on another case. This was supposed to be the movie that broke the mold a little bit and put it in a, a courtroom drama and like a i know james wan said it was like seven meets the the exorcist or whatever mm-hmm. and i gotta be honest i didn't feel any of that in this movie i didn't just because feel... you steal a shot from the exorcist doesn't make you the exorcist yes um i think that it was a gutsy move to, to change up the format, but I don't feel like it changed it enough. It still fell back on so many tropes and not even tropes from the first two conjuring movies, but from the worst of the spinoffs. Mm-hmm. And I just, oof, I don't know. So let's, should we jump into the premise a little, a yeah. little bit to set it up? Because that's sort of where some of my problems stem from this movie. Mm-hmm. So it has, it's the little boy from uh hunting of Hill house. Yes. Which, the the oh youngest God, son, and I he's hope, so good. I, lo- I, I that kid is awesome. I I hope he has a long illustrious uh-huh. career out of him yeah, because he, I enjoy watching it. I do too. He he's he's just got this 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 like seven eight year old cuteness to him, like innocence yeah. to him. And basically, he's getting possessed. He, he's possessed by a demon, and ooky spooky stuff happens. Um, I don't know if I like the ooky spooky stuff that happens, especially with his like exorcism scene of his body contorting and oh stop your heart old yeah, man yeah <laughs> and he does uh, i mean Just, oh god i couldn't yeah so when this movie opens it is going a mile a minute it's yeah. taking zero time to set up anything in this yeah. movie which i don't i don't like because james wan was all about setting everything up yeah. and setting up who the characters are why we should like them why we need to care about all of them there's this, no atmosphere. This movie's like, F that. We are jumping into this shit right away. Like, there's a scene, like, honestly, like, right away in the opening where the kid's, like, taking a bath or in the bath or hiding in yeah. the bathtub. And you see, like, like comes out of nowhere. Like, there's no setup to what this kid's running away from, why he's in the bathroom. And then all of a sudden you see ooky spooky hands climb over the yeah. rails. And that's kind of it. And it's like, okay, okay. And then, all right, next scene. It's, it's- like... 
it takes no time to set up any of the scares. It's just like, what can we throw at audiences to scare 13 year olds? Yeah. It, 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 it's very clear from the very first scene that this movie, the, the filmmakers behind the movie took the mindset of bigger and louder is scarier. And we've seen in multiple movies, multiple sequels that that is not the case. Mm -hmm. Um, there's I mean, no sense of nuance. My favorite scene of the series is someone whispering. Yeah. With no other sound behind them. Yeah. And we'll get to that one. Yeah. It, it's just loud brash in your face. Mm -hmm. No subtlety to any of this movie. I would say yeah. it's, the only subtlety comes in the performances of Wilson and Farmiga because they are just so good. And even then they have such ham fisted dialogue. Mm -hmm that it kind of sucks the nuance out of their performances. To be honest, I, I feel like we were about 30 minutes into this movie and I looked at Maria and I was like, does it not feel like they fed a bot the script for the first two conjuring movies and then had it spit out all the dialogue for the Warrens because everything that they said was the most generic, like broad, th like, we have to start this exorcism now and things like that. I, I was just yikes, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, there are some cool shots in this. There's some cool direction, but the script is such a massive letdown to me. I mean, wouldn't you agree? Yeah, I, for me, overall, the entire the entirety of what made the first two Conjuring movies work is that it did have a, uh, I think that it has, I don't know if I would say great script, but a script that allows the directors and actors to, to morph that into something great. Mm -hmm. Because I think Farmiga and Wilson are, are great in every movie that they appear in this series. Yeah. I think they just both understand it. They have great chemistry with each other. Mm -hmm. But then working with Juan seems like magic happening on screen. Uh, yeah. For me, like they are the, the best horror couple of any movie ever. Uh, and, uh, yeah, event, yeah, any horror movie ever, those two together. I think they're just so good. They have such great chemistry and fully understand the material that they're in. Yeah. Whereas in this one, they're not given a whole lot to do that's different than the first three movies that they've uh, appeared in. Yeah. Uh, Until the third act in which it goes completely off the rails. Yeah. And for me, it, it, it falls back on the tropes of the first movie that it didn't need to. It should have set itself apart where we were mm -hmm. promised a courtroom drama style of horror movie. And it's not really no. that at all there's scenes in a courtroom but there are maybe two scenes in the entire yeah. thing that's at anything remotely related to the actual case that they're talking about and the rest is spent on some generic satanist witch yeah <laughs> this movie this movie feels like it was ripped out of the satanic panic era but not in a good way it's not one of the good it's not a rosemary's baby mm -hmm. It it's it's a satanic panic. Yeah, it feels like it feels very much like the religious aspect of these movies was amped up to eleven here, mm -hmm. and it doesn't work. It 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 almost feels weirdly enough. I I almost felt like I was being preached to throughout parts of this movie. I was like, this is this is a little odd, like just the, the, the dismissive way of them dealing with the Satanist and just, Oh, they're just evil because they're evil. And, and I was just like, yikes, man. Yikes. Yeah. There's just certain steps that they, I wish they would have taken in this series that they have not yet. Like yeah. they tried to throw in, you know, Ed's, I wanted Ed's the heart werewolf attack. movie and instead I, I, I got wanted this. The, I wanted the <laughs> werewolf movie too, Sam. Uh, and, uh, and when they said that initially, like, oh, this is going to be completely different than the, the, you know, the first two movies. I'm like, oh yeah, they're doing the werewolf. Hell yeah. yeah. Let's do it. No, let's not. Let's just do the same thing we did in the last two. Um, but not good. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they, like they could have done a courtroom drama. They could have focused on maybe the criticisms of Ed and Lorraine Warren in yeah. real life, especially. Well, 
because and they, during this time in which they lived, yeah, they even hint at it. And Annabelle comes home. The, the like criticisms that they face. I'm like, why would you not expand on mm-hmm. that? You know, this is clearly a follow up to that. And I, yeah. Yeah. So it relies too much on the tropes of the first, uh, of not even the first two movies, the entire series of, it relies on more of like, this reminded me of the first Annabelle movie, not in a good way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, and for me, it doesn't even have that iconic style of scene that I, the no. first Annabelle does like, I, I think Annabelle has one really great scene in that movie. Yeah. The, the, the stairwell staircase. scene. Yeah. yeah. It, that starts in the basement, works its way up the stairs. Uh, this movie just has none of that. This is yeah. a, a very forgettable movie. Can we talk for a minute about the bloated corpse that runs at them like a bull? Because that's, that happened. And I was literally like, you're kidding, right? That's, that didn't actually happen in a conjuring movie. That was the cheesiest, dumbest effect they could have done. It wasn't scary. Mm-hmm. It made me laugh. I was like, <laughs> really? That's what they're doing? That's how they're trying to scare me right now? Like, I just, oh, yeah. God. And again, Michael Chavez might be a great guy. Yeah. He's not a I'm great sure. horror director, and and, he, and that's nothing he knows against his the guy. stuff. If yeah. you listen to interviews, like he's very much passionate about horror. I just his movies don't click for me. There's something about it that just like the passion does not come through mm-hmm. on screen. Yeah, I I just don't think he was. The, I don't I don't know who chose him or why. I just don't think he was the correct choice to do a Conjuring movie. No. Hell, I would I would be fun, like Curse of the Gagarona was like whatever. It's a kind of just an offshoot of the Conjuring series. Yeah. Let him do that type of stuff then. Mm-hmm. But for me and for fans, he didn't prove himself in that movie to be like, all right, that's the next guy doing the Conjuring movie. Whereas Gary Doberman, who does Annabelle Comes it. Home, is like, why is this guy not doing the third one? He well, totally understands this series. It I is- mean, he's been writing it since yeah. the beginning. Doberman has been one of the i mean aside from juan he's the most driving force of this universe and he clearly made one of the best movies in the universe mm-hmm. in annabelle comes home the best conjuring 3 that we're going to get yeah yeah so i'm going <laughs> to tell my kids that annabelle comes home is the conjuring 3 and that the series stopped there because nothing since then has been <laughs> yeah worth it I don't know. So yeah, that's I. I don't want to shit on this movie too no, much. I don't much more, But it's just it just didn't work, and it's just dis- I think it's more of that we're just disappointed because we both love the series. Yeah, especially the Conjuring movies, but mm-hmm. the series as a whole. I've said this many times. It's like the Conjuring universe is easily the second best cinematic universe aside from Marvel. Yeah, it just is. Oh, and I I genuinely I mean. <laughs> I was very excited sitting down to watch this. Like I did you watch in the theater at home? I watched it at home. I, I like horror movies in the theater, like something like a quiet place where it's like almost like action horror type. You know what I mean? And you don't need any, you don't want any distractions during that. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's one thing. And like, but something like ghostly and spooky, like what the first two con, like I didn't see the first two conjuring movies in the theater. Um, I watched them at home after dark with the lights off. I put my phone away. I just immersed myself and I really enjoyed that experience. And so I was ready to recreate that experience mm-hmm. with the devil made me do it. Uh, we did, we turned off all the lights and it, it was just, you know, I, I had to resist the urge to pull out my phone at multiple points in this movie because I, I wanted to, you know, I knew we were doing the episode on it. I was like, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sit here and play Candy Crush through half of this movie if I'm going to be talking about it on a podcast. You could have. I probably could have, but I was just, you know, it it bummed me out. It really did. Um, and I don't think I don't think anybody wanted to like this movie more than I did. <laughs> I, I I was just supremely disappointed mm-hmm. in it, and it 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 really bummed me out that it was that it was as disappointing as it was. Um. But that said, I'm going to end on a positive note with it. I really did like the performances, particularly from Arnie, who is the guy who gets possessed Mm -hmm. after the kid. I thought the guy who played him was really good. And 
the scene in which he actually stabs the dude, I thought was really well done. Like the, the murder scene that kicks off the, the rest of the plot was fun. I, I did enjoy that. Um, it was, it was, it was the most pizzazz I saw Chavez put into this whole movie in that one scene. And I enjoyed it for, for that. Yeah. I don't know. This is just one that will fall into for me, the Lex kind of like the first Annabelle and curse of Yorona where I'm, yep. I watch it. I'm good. Yeah. Probably never going to watch it again. Yep. I'll probably still buy it because I have all of the conjuring <laughs> movies and I have to, uh-huh. I just, I have to have them. But I'm, I'm probably never actually going to watch it. Should we jump into The Conjuring 2? Yes. Electric Boogaloo? Yes. Uh, I, man. <laughs> the Conjuring 2. Um, yeah. I So I saw this movie in theaters. Uh, the only ones I have not seen are the, the first Conjuring and then the newest one in theaters. Okay. Um, but this movie, like, yeah, again, has that James Wan aesthetic where... Uh, for me, James Wan continues to grow as a director in pretty much everything that he does. And the con, the first conjuring really showed that, um, yeah. where I think that movie is just a horror masterpiece. Mm-hmm. This movie doesn't work quite as well for me. And that's mostly third act stuff. But again, James Wan takes his time to set up stories, sets up characters. Uh, one of the biggest, um, like ghost stories in the UK, uh, the 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 uh, Enfield, the Enfield Poltergeist. Poltergeist, um, which oh, actually, let's jump back to Conjuring Devil Made Me Do It, and I'll okay. tie it back to this. End credits of Conjuring Devil Made Me Do It are the scariest part of the movie. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. This movie incorporates this what would be the scariest parts of the movie of the real tapes into the goddamn movie, yeah. where they show the, t- the 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 girl and and like having her on camera, and you don't really see anything, and you just hear the voice, mm-hmm. like. Uh, it's so goddamn good. Yeah. Uh, I think performances in this movie, again, are really great. What Juan does is like you already know and love the Warrens, but the family that they're investigating, you need to love them just as much. Mm-hmm. Whereas the devil made me do it. I don't care about anyone in that family. Yeah. Yeah. This one you again do just like you did the uh the family in the first movie. Yeah, I I really so I actually liked The Conjuring too. I I've seen this movie. This was my third time watching it now, um, and the first time I watched it, I really loved it. The second time I watched it, I it my my enthusiasm for it actually dipped. And then this third time, I I, I actually a little more favorable on it mm-hmm. again. Um, it's a movie that has a lot of flaws in it, and I think part of that is the Warrens are separate from our main family for a large part of this runtime. Uh, so you're, you're seeing two different storylines that don't really have a whole lot of momentum behind them. Yeah. Or connect connected to each other very much. Yeah. And then, it, I mean, it obviously by the end, by the third act, it, it connects them and it makes it, you know, it makes it kind of make sense like oh okay this is where it all clicks um one of my favorite things about this is the egregious needle drop of london calling you know to let us know that we're in the uk mm-hmm. because there are no other songs you can needle drop to let us know that we're in the uk no. did you know that casey we have to know we're in the uk L- london calling is the only song about <laughs> london or the uk that you can use yeah (laughs) um no i i do love this movie uh i think valak is i don't think it's it's a hot take to say valak is is the the nun is scarier here than she is in her own movie Mm -hmm. 100 percent. um and i i like the nun more than most i think it's a fun throwaway jump scare minute horror but uh just some of the some of the early scenes with Valak are like my favorite moments in any conjuring movie uh especially the painting scene mm-hmm. that scene i know it's coming and it still like rattles my sphincter every time it every time it happens it's like oh god uh, i i just i dig that i think this is the sweetest Ed and Lorraine are together mm-hmm. um, because I know in the not to jump ahead to the first one already. Uh, I know in the first one, it's Ed being worried about Lorraine 
because she saw the, you know, saw something at a, at one of their recent uh, exorcisms. This one turns the tables and it's Lorraine worrying about Ed because she's seeing visions of his death. She knows that they're getting in over their heads. And I, I just, I love that story. I, I think this is the, this is the best that the Warrens as a couple have been in this movie. Um, even if the pacing leaves a little bit to be desired every time they're on screen, I'm totally invested, you know? And then the scene at the end, I mean, jumping all the way to the end of this movie of Ed singing, he's singing Elvis at the end. Yeah. Right? Singing yeah. Elvis. Yep. Yep. It's, it's just a, such a melancholy type of ending to yeah. a balls to the wall, crazy third act of this movie that I find very charming. Yeah. Of like the, yeah, because the third act of the movie is really where I have my problems with it, with the nun in that room. It goes like way big, way big. All yeah. of a sudden it's like, Oh, what movie are we in now? Because everything is just super loud things that were not really, the series is pretty well grounded up until yeah. that point. And yeah. I think that's a turning point for this entire series of, okay, this is how crazy we can go. Yep. And why not keep going crazier? And, and I, yeah. And for me, uh, w- what I find that works in this movie, though, is that, again, like we, we have said, Ed and Lorraine Warren and their chemistry with Patrick Wilson, Vera Farmiga, is that you can have this crazy balls to the wall ending with Valak. Uh, and that's just literally just loud noises and Vera Farmiga yelling at Valak to go away um, ends with him singing an acoustic Elvis song. Yeah. Like, I find that very charming. Yeah, I do. I, I I think the loud ending here works more than when than in other movies, you know. But I think that's because of the restraint Juan shows for the first two acts. Mm-hmm. Um, but you're right. This is very clearly the turning point for the franchise where it's this is where we're gonna go from here. Mm-hmm. And it, it and I mean, this movie also does the thing of, I think the, the first movie introduces Annabelle, yep. which is now spun off into its own series. But I think Annabelle was maybe the most notorious like thing in their collection mm-hmm. of like, yeah, we should, we should include that because Annabelle is a fun little thing to have in, in the, in a Warren's movie and yep. makes sense to have it in it. And then it, that spun off into its own thing. Whereas this movie, the, crooked man and the nun are just not based on anything. They're based yeah. on whatever Gary Dobberman thought of and James Wan th- right. both thought of, which um, the crooked man is terrifying. I love the crooked man. Yeah. The it, crooked man is the spinoff I wanted out of this movie. Sorry. The nun. Uh, I mean, I definitely wanted a nun spinoff. I just, as much as I like the nun, I do wish it was a better movie. Mm-hmm. I wish I wish they had utilized Valak a little more in that. And again, with this series where I'm kind of okay if they never do a Warren movie again. Yeah. Um, unless you get James Wan to just do one more. This is it with them. Do the werewolf movie, please, James Wan. Um, but I would love to continue to see this movie series go on with the spinoffs. Like yeah. do it still do a crooked man movie. I think people would definitely go check it out or on HBO max, just do a, a series of like five to seven movies of different spinoffs. Like you could do the, the one with the, what is it? Quarters, oh, the fairy man, the fairy yeah. man. You could do the haunted wedding dress. Yeah. You could do a, the werewolf. You could do all these different spinoffs then. Uh, but yeah, I think the crooked man is great in this movie as a, great scene with him as well well and the like little nursery rhyme sing song thing that goes along with Mm -hmm. him it's almost like if wes anderson decided to do like a serial killer movie or something (laughs) you know like it it, it's got that classic like whimsical feel but within the context of the movie it's terrifying Mm -hmm. i love it and the fairy man has such a great look and design too and very unique because uh i i think this series does a great job of combining practical and visual effects all into one, especially mm-hmm. with the crooked man where it's just oh yeah, all the body movements are just of a dude. Yeah. Whereas that creepy smile is obviously yeah CG, CG, but that doesn't matter because everything else looks incredibly great around him. So yeah, I would, yeah, I would love a crooked man movie. I, I think he is a great character to further explore for this series. Oh, for sure. For sure. And I, yeah, 
my biggest my biggest concern with like with these conjuring movies is, is they're they're kind of it feels like they're losing what made these ones so special i mean we we've talked about it, even by the end of this movie it, it almost loses what made the first two acts of this movie even so special and i watched i i double featured the conjuring and the conjuring 2 about a week after i watched the conjuring the devil made me do it and i felt like at the end of the conjuring 2 i was like this is where the warren story really needed to end um this is a perfect send off for them i don't i don't think if they would have never made another conjuring movie i would have been okay with that mm-hmm. um annabelle comes home i know they're in it yeah but they're, that's they're like the fifth yeah fifth and sixth characters yeah that's their daughter's story there and i think that's cool i think i think i would watch a a ton of movies i i I would watch three more movies with mckenna grace as judy warren dealing with the fallout from like what her parents Mm -hmm. have done you know and yeah there's no reason this movie couldn't series can continue like do a sort of modern day movie with someone else cast as the daughter yeah and you could have something like an un, uh, an unsolved case that she's trying to now solve that her parents left behind like there's yeah. so many ways that this series continue to go and i i hope they do i don't want it to I end with this movie because as, as far as i know nothing else is in production for this series i thought they had a they had announced a screenwriter for a nun sequel if I remember correctly, oh. I think there is a The Nun 2 that is in development. I will, I'll do a little search. That doesn't necessarily yeah. mean that we will get a Nun 2, but I was actually kind of excited too because the writer they attached to it was pretty decent. I'll look it up here. Um, future films is what, what they're showing is that The Crooked Man and The Nun are both in development. Okay. Yeah. What it's, what it's saying. Uh, Crooked Man. I don't. I don't think will happen. Uh, it might be a little too late for that. I could still see the nun eventually happening. Um, mm. the screenwriter they have for the nun too is the is the one who wrote Hellfest, which I oh. really loved. So I was because I remember her. Uh, I remember her uh, getting announced as the uh, as the screenwriter, and I was like, okay. I would watch another nun movie if she was the one writing it. Mm-hmm. So, um, the yeah, they also have a comic book series which you and I I know we've talked about. I need mm-hmm. to go pick that one up. Yeah, at least continue it in some form. Let's get yeah the comic book se- Let's let's Scooby do this thing. Honestly, it would make a great TV series. Mm-hmm. It really would. Uh, there there are so many ways that they could take this franchise forward. Um, and I I really hope that even though I haven't particularly cared for the last few installments, I really hope this continues as something that just, I don't know. Like I said, I, uh, why not Scooby-Doo this thing? Let yeah. it just continue to go in different forms. Do, do a comic book series, do a TV series, do Introduce different a talking dog. Why not? Yeah. Yeah. This movie already has, you know, werewolves and nun yeah. crazy, uh, supernatural nuns. It has bloated dead guys running it people yeah a haunted wedding dress yeah i mean it's got it all so why not include a talking dog let's get the i mean if warner brothers who does own both of these series of scooby-doo and the conjuring uh wants to do a scooby-doo meets the conjuring meets the warrens movie oh my god uh please call that would make a sam lens and casey kelderman for a direct direct to dvd movie of scooby-doo meets the warrens that would actually be a great episode of scooby-doo and guess who like ed and lorraine warren yeah oh my god that would be <laughs> i kind of want to do that now <laughs> right about oh <laughs> uh, all right should we jump into the last movie then i mean yes. obviously it's the best movie of of the entire series it's a me. five out of five for me yeah, it's, it's a, a banger it's a masterpiece um it's yeah one one of the great horror movies of this time maybe one of the great horror movies of really all time supernatural horror movies especially um yeah this movie so the first conjuring movie i think shocked a lot of people of how well it is because i i love insidious where i also one i just have not gotten into i also think it's uh. a five star 
movie. I, I think Insidious might be scarier than The Conjuring, but I think The Conjuring is a better movie for me. Um, but like, that's really where James Wan is also in, goes from Saw James Wan and uh, Dead, and like Silence, Dead Silence and what was the the Which, one with Kevin know. Bacon. Oh, Death Sentence. Death Sentence yeah, and yeah. then Insidious. And now The Conjuring is kind of like, boom, he's hit it. Now he's he's a Hollywood mainstream A-list director now. Yeah, James Wan has done some really, like, I I still think he's one of the most underrated directors working today. Because, I'm sorry, Aquaman is one of the best DCEU movies. And I, but I, I genuinely, I think fat, the, fat, Fury, what is it? Furious seven, fast seven, fast and the Furious oh seven. God, yeah. Uh, might be the best directed. Yeah. Out of all the, I dig movies. that movie a lot. And he had to, he had a massive yeah. workaround that he had to do with that. And he still pulled it off. Mm-hmm. I mean, th- this dude is highly underrated. Um, but I do think that the conjuring is his, I, I, I personally consider the conjuring to be his masterpiece. Mm -hmm. I think it is his best movie. Um, I can't watch this one after dark. I literally watched both of these, uh, the conjuring and the conjuring two in the middle of the day, because I was like, I'm, I scrolled past it on Netflix one night while it was like 1130. It was actually the night after the night I watched It's Me, Billy. I was scrolling through Netflix trying to find something fun. Mm -hmm. And I was just going through the recommended. And of course, it recommends The Conjuring. And like my remote stopped working as I got to The Conjuring. And it was playing like, oh, God, what was it? I think it was the clap scene. Mm -hmm. And it freaked me out so bad. I was like, oh no, I can't. Just shut the TV off. I was like, I was like trying to find the the like TV remote because it was on my Roku one. I was like, oh God, I gotta get I gotta get this off. But uh no, I love oh god, I love the conjuring. It I think the thing that the the best thing about the conjuring is that it it's it's you could call it a slow burn, and it is, but I mean it kicks off the plot pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. And really, they're at the Perrin household within the like second act. I mean, by the time the second act starts, they're Mm -hmm. there. It's such a breezy movie too. It sets, it's such a smooth transition for everyone in the, in this movie for like introductions, knowing the characters, how they all become connected. Because like when you open up with a family in that, well, I mean, it has the cold open with Annabelle, which I think is a great cold. open. Oh my God, it is. It's terrifying. It's the best use of Annabelle of any movie. Mm -hmm. Annabelle comes home. I don't love because of Annabelle. I love it because everything else in that movie. Um, Annabelle comes home is literally like, she's not, I don't even, if it wasn't, or if her name wasn't in the title, I don't even know if I would remember that she was in that movie. Uh huh. (laughs) Uh, <laughs> definitely agree. Um, yeah, this is the best use of Annabelle in any yeah. movie where I, th- I think Annabelle, the doll itself is, is best used in smaller confined, yeah. uh, c- cameo appearances really more than its own movie about the doll. Yeah. Um, and it has a great cold open and then you have the family moving into the house, which is just some masterful directing and camera work by Juan. Uh, and that opening of following the family through the house, which is mimicked in the devil made me do it but yeah. it just feels like well, you're just doing James Wan's, Wan's thing. Yep. Um, but then you have the introduction of the Warrens, uh, you know, giving a lecture too at a, at a university. And it's like, everything is just moving at such a breezy pace of setting all the characters up mm-hmm. and s- then setting up, you know, uh, how the family is haunted as well. And it's such, again, it is sort of a slow burn, but I, there's some genuine scares throughout yeah. The, the entirety of the movie. I mean, it opens with Annabelle. Yeah. Then you get the character setups and then it's like, all right, we're going to slowly creep our way into the I mean, scares because yeah, the scares of like, uh, the dog won't go into the house, the dog, you but, have the, uh, the laundry mm-hmm. of the sheet outside. Yep. Um, you yeah. have the, the, the clap game, the clap game. Um, what was the, the, scene where all the picture or the the picture frames come mm-hmm. off of the walls like that's terrifying and then you have my, my favorite scene out of probably any of these movies is in this this one i think it's easily the scariest one of the two girls in the room uh and basically like the sheets getting pulled off and their and your legs getting pulled and stuff and the girls like one of the gr- girls like it's like don't turn around 
she's standing right behind you. Just yeah. like the way that line is delivered, and you're like, you don't see anything either, and you're like, mm-hmm. oh my god, what's there? What's going to be behind the door? It keeps going to her face, and like tears are uh-huh. streaming down. I mean, that is one of the best child performances. I love it. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, it just zooms in on that creepy dark space behind the door. Yeah, we see nothing, yeah. but it's just everything in a performance there. But mm-hmm. also, then you have the the uh, uh, jump scare chron- chronicle chronicles of Narnia. The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe is right above the <laughs> their wardrobe there. Oh my god! Uh, which is such a great jump scare right after that. That that visual caught me so off guard the first time I saw this movie to a point where, like, I I actually I don't scream at movies much. I screamed at that part. Like it was, it freaked me out. I haven't seen this in, in a while. That that scene with the wardrobe is right after the whispering. Scene, I think correct? so. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I. Yeah, it's within, I, I'm within pretty that sure. Same scene, yeah, I right? think it's within yeah. the same scene. Yep. And that's what works so well with James Wan is that the the girl whispering and crying, and we see nothing but a black space mm-hmm. is all crazy, insane setup that only Juan can could can really do like no one else right now is doing these types no. of scares that James Wan is doing because for us, like horror fans that have pretty much seen everything that scares us. But then you have the payoff of the thing on the wardrobe of mm. like, Oh my God, there's the jump scare after the intense setup yeah. to it. And it doesn't feel cheap. I don't no. feel like there's a single cheap jump scare in this movie. I don't mind jump scares. But like, okay, perfect example of it, uh, The Devil Inside, that horrible found footage movie that Brent w- William Brent Bell did. The only of his I have not seen. Oh, oh, God. Casey, it's so bad. I'll eventually watch it. I own it. it oh, God. <laughs> um, I find I've, a certain charm in his movies that, like, this is horrible, I but do I'm, too. I'm like, smiling during it. I enjoy I enjoy most of his at least on like a superficial like whatever it's a jump scare movie level that one is the one that I just like if I was 12 years old this be the scariest thing ever yeah exactly um but there's there's a scare in the in the like literally within the first couple minutes of the devil inside where it's just the characters walking down the street next to a fence and a dog jumps up and starts barking at them from the fence and every jump scare in that movie is something like that. It's just a cheap, cheap jump scare. It's no like, setup what, to it. Why, why even ha- like that's, that's not scaring people. That's startling them. And it's startling them for no yeah. reason. There's nothing behind that. And it just, those types of jump scares are what really bother me. And I think that's why like the nun doesn't bother me quite as much because like at least at least the nun is behind most of the jump scares that are in that movie. It's not like, Oh, a bird flew past me or, you know what I mean? Um, and I just, I appreciate that the conjuring actually like takes a step back and, and really just lets you sit in the, in the tone and in the mood of the Mm -hmm. movie, because it just, there's more, there's more, I'm more scared of the stuff that I can think of in my head than if you just show me a, a, mm-hmm. a bloated dead guy running at me. You know, I I think the reason that the door shot is so terrifying is because you're picturing what you imagine yeah. when you're home alone. You know, like that's that it, it automatically puts you into the shoes of the character and makes you project your fear to where that is. And I think that's brilliant mm-hmm. and more horror movies need to do things like that yeah and this is one of those horror movies that were, it got an r rating and had everybody questioning making this movie well, why are we getting an r rating we're not showing any there's no blood yeah there's no swearing there's no nudity there's no swearing where what what can we cut and the mpaa was like you just can't you can't cut anything this is just too scary yeah like we can't allow kids to come into this yeah anyone from 13 to 17 cannot watch this movie no it's like why not just because it's that scary and uh, i i think that's become a blessing and a curse for this series of Mm -hmm. having that r rating and i think all of them have that r rating i don't think a single one of them has said the only one for me that i think warrants that is annabelle creation just because that has gore yeah 
but everything else is also just very team. And now well, it's kind of become a gimmick for them to have that R rating. I suppose the conjuring two has like the branch coming through Patrick Wilson's chest yeah, or yeah. whatever, but you can get away with it. Yeah, 13. exactly. It has been a blessing and a curse though. And yeah, like the devil made me do it. Now was, they, I think yeah. they've just embraced. Yeah. Embraced it of, yeah, we got an R rating just cause we're that damn scary. Yeah. Now it's kind of a pride thing i think with with this entire series which yeah like we said is a blessing and a curse and uh i yeah i love I, I don't know if it's still i still to this day don't know if it warrants an r rating oh i think it does i like it genuinely terrifies me it is and it, if that's movie. the reason that they gave i can't argue with that you know what i mean because i don't know like i've always said like if i had kids they would be starting horror very young you know, like I would be showing my six year old the Lost Boys. But I got to be honest, I don't know if I would show my kid the conjuring until they were 15, 16 years old, just because, like, it is that, mm-hmm. that, like, oh, you gotta I get be chills. able to handle that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So. Should, we, so, should we wrap up the conjuring conversation? Yeah. So, I mean, our rankings, right? Yeah. One, two, three. Yeah, one, two, three. One, two, three. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, for me, this is, like, for me, like, uh, the entire series is 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 kind of like those type of movies. Kind of all just fall into together. Like the first Conjuring is my favorite, and then mm-hmm. I would go Comes Home, and then like Conjuring Two and Creation fall in there, and yeah. then it starts to drop off for me. Like then the Nun and Annabelle and Conjuring Devil made me do it, and La Llorona. I think that we have almost. I, yeah. I I'm pretty sure my rating, my ranking would be identical. Like there's three tiers for me. Yeah, that, that these all fall in. Like the first Annabelle comes home and the first Conjuring, and then mm-hmm. Conjuring two, Annabelle creation. Yeah, because Annabelle not, creation is mean yeah. as shit. Oh my god. We'll do an episode on the Annabelle movies. Yeah, we, we down, really should because road. I I dig those. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, and I think most conjuring fans kind of fall into that same category. Yeah. We do too. So, yep, for sure. It, it's a, it's a franchise that has very clear quality lines drawn through it. Um, but I, I, I gotta say there's only like two or three. Well, there's two that I don't know if I'll ever watch again. I even I've I've rewatched Annabelle a few times to be totally honest. Um, I haven't watched it since the theater. I kind of want to just give it another shot. It's not good, but it's also not terrible. I don't think it's quite as terrible as everybody says, but I don't know. I'm also like super lenient with movies. So yeah, yeah I mean, you watch the Chopping Mall twice a week, so I no oh God, I love Chopping Mall so much. <laughs> Uh, since we talked about a Hanna Barbera cartoon earlier with Scooby Doo, yeah, uh, should we talk about a different Hanna Barbera cartoon? We should hashtag do heads also hashtag do heads. We did we we did we got our Scooby Doo in. We got our Scooby Doo in. Uh, uh, have yeah. you uh, just before we jump into the Flintstones thing? Uh, have you watched the new Scooby Doo yet? The it's like the medieval. I have not watched it yet. Nearby. I I have it. I have not watched it yet. Should we do a movie night? We should we should do a movie. Let's night. throw in another one. Um, I don't know. Well, <laughs> sorority babes in the slip <laughs> with Scooby, the new Scooby Doo movie. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Sure. Uh, Flintstones. Yes, we're gonna fan slash the Flintstones. Do you do you want to go first? Or you want me to go first, or how do you how you want to do this? Uh, I don't. I I can go first if 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 you want. I'll, I'll uh, go. I, I, yeah, you go first. You, you, go. you, you save yours for last. Best okay. for last. Um, so, yeah, when he sent me this literally this this morning or last night, yeah. of, we're doing. <laughs> it was like right before I went to bed. <laughs> yeah, like we're doing the Flintstones. I'm like, oh, sure, why not? Um, and honestly, like it didn't take me that long to figure out as soon as I started writing the characters down of like who I want in the movie. I was like, okay, but where are the Flintstones going to configure into to this? Because I'm going to put. You know, Fred and uh, Wilma and Barney and Betty and Pebbles and Bam Bam and the dog Dino uh, into into the this movie. So I'm like, where can I fit all of them in? And what movie sort of has a family dynamic like that? Um, so, so they're in The Conjuring? It is The Conjuring. <laughs> the Flintstones made me do it. Um, 
<laughs> no, I'm going to do the title of this movie is going to be called um, The Bedrock Has Eyes. Oh, my God. Yes. So uh, the Flintstones are going on a family trip and they have brought along uh, the Barney and Betty and Bam Bam along with them. Uh, they've also taken Dino along on this trip as they are traveling through the uh you know, prehistoric desert. Um, and then they come across, I had to look this one up because I'm like, well, who's going to play my <laughs> group of cannibalistic uh, inbreds that live in the hills of, of outside bedrock. Um, I came across the, the uh, basically they're kind of like the rivals of the Flintstones called the hat rocks. Oh, yep. 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 The hillbilly characters. Mm -hmm. um, and so I immediately looked them up. I'm like, oh, my God. Yes, those are the the candles from Hills Have Eyes oh in this movie. Um, yes. <laughs> so that's that's it's the Hills Have Eyes. And you literally just insert all the characters from from the Flintstones, because honestly, there is like pretty much the only character you're adding is Bam Bam. Yeah. Because everything, and you're only having one dog dino in this. But instead of like, uh, that's. A, that's actually brilliant. Uh, my, instead of you a, should have gone second because mine is not that good. <laughs> instead of a nuclear family, it's it's the Barney and his wife and kid are coming along with. Yeah, so I like that. I really like that. Like, can you imagine? Like, I don't know, Fred's Fred's like ankle breaks or something. Like, that's why the car stops. Like, <laughs> and that's why he can't. That's why he can't get up to 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 go. So he sends Barney out to to go to the next town, and Barney gets it first. Dude, I love Benny this. Benny is devastated. I want to petition Boomerang to have an adults-only page so mm -hmm. that they can make this. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, how the first the first movie ends with, like, the guy smashing the rock. Um, yep. Obviously, Bam Bam is <laughs> Bam -Bam beating the shit out of this guy with yeah. this uh, big club. <laughs> oh, my so, God. Yeah. I love that. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to incorporate a little of Hills Have Eyes, too. Uh, Dino is going to have a flashback sequence to something in this movie, too. Okay. Oh my God. I love it. I love it. Well, here's my shitty fan slash. <laughs> um, so I was thinking about particularly just like Fred and Wilma and then Pebbles and what, what I could put them in particular to, uh, to like accentuate the family aspect, you know, because like The Simpsons is a family show. You need horror with uh, you need a horror movie with a family. Mm -hmm. Fred's got anger issues. It's very clear from multiple episodes of The Flintstones. So they're going to go to the Overrock Hotel <laughs> for the winter. And Fred is going to be the caretaker. And obviously some shit's going to go down and Fred's going to go crazy and he's going to try and kill Pebbles. And Wilma. And I was even thinking, like, if you wanted to throw another character in, because, I mean, those are really the only three characters in The Shining. But if you wanted, like, Dick Halloran in there, yeah, Barney can be Dick Halloran. <laughs> hey, you got The Shining, kiddo? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That was, that was mine. It's not as well thought out or detailed <laughs> as yours. But, yeah, Fred Flintstone is Jack Torrance in The Shining. Uh -huh. He is Freddy. <laughs> I can see it. So yeah, that's my that's my lackluster fan slash. You definitely should have gone. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It just immediately came into my mind of like, no, that's brilliant. I love that. What can I? What can we put them in? That's so cool. I I dig it. So uh, yeah, if that uh, the the artist that does all the Scooby Doo interpretations of the Scooby Doo gang meeting with like slasher villains, slasher villains, uh, please do the Flintstones in. Hills yes. have eyes. Oh my god! So, yeah. I love it. I love it. Uh, let's not set anything up for next week because I like doing it on the fly. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> let's do it. Yeah. Well, uh, maybe we'll come up with another fan slash the night before we record. Maybe. So, God, I had fun with this. Yeah, this that was a good fun. episode. That was fun. Yeah. Uh, next month we will do another episode. Yeah. What's the topic? We're not sure yet. We're not sure yet. We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. Hopefully Blake will join us. If not, me and Sam will be back. Yes. So should we get to uh, some plugs and then wrap it up? Yeah. Let's plug. Um, as always, you can find 
me personally on Instagram, uh, Lens on Film. You can follow me on Twitter at Film Lens. And you can always have conversations with Casey and I on the South Dakota Film Community Group on Facebook. Mm -hmm. uh, we are available on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play. Mm, yeah. Well, wherever you can find pretty podcast, much anywhere pretty sure. else where you can find podcasts. Uh, go ahead and follow Backlot605 on all of our socials. We are at Backlot605. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, Insta. We don't do TikTok because we're old, but, you know. No, we, we don't. <laughs> the only TikTok we know is the Kesha song. The Kesha song. That also makes us feel old. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Where, what, what Sam said. Yeah, I think you nailed, nailed all the plugs. Uh, Dang, did I actually? I think so. I don't think. We have uh, anything else we got to plug? Oh, we should maybe plug our Pixar countdown. Oh, yes. Nothing to do with horror, but we're doing a Pixar countdown uh, July 3rd. There's got to be some crossover, right? Yeah. Pixar horror movie. Yeah. Uh, there was a Toy Story Halloween special. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, July 3rd, 7 p.m. Uh, we'll again do it on Facebook Live and YouTube, and uh, it'll be live in person at Spellbound Magic Shop in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. So if you want to come hang out, hear some nerds talk about some Pixar movies and yell at each other for two hours, please come and join us. Sam will be hosting this yes. event. And I am stirring the pot, and it is already very heated. It's a very hot pot. and it's a hot pot. I'm, I'm, I'm stirring it vigorously. <laughs> Yeah, so, so go go check that out. Um, yeah, I think that's 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 all we got right now. That's all we got, I think. All right. You want to give our sign off and I'll yeah. hit the music. Let's do it. All right. Listeners of the Slash Lot, we'll spook you later. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Mm -hmm.